guess it goes back to even like 2009. When I was in, in Ramallah as a, a volunteer with DCI Palestine in the summer of 2009, I remember you know, having conversations with the, the advocacy team. And uh, at the time, the director was uh, Rafat Kassis uh, about trying to engage Americans more and think of ways to kind of bring the, the, the issues that DCI Palestine worked on that were specific to children to American audiences in some way. Um, so I think the, the, the seeds, so to speak, for something like the No Way to Treat a Child campaign stretches back to, to you know, that summer. Um, fast forward to 2013, uh, Rafat, myself, and, and another colleague uh, traveled from Ramallah to the U.S. for a speaking tour and sort of advocacy events, and really just to sort of make the case um, to Rafat himself that shifting some advocacy and strategy to engaging with American audiences was you know, something that we needed to do with DCI Palestine, and uh, also that we were the ones to do it um, with the issues that we worked on, the child-focused advocacy, documentation, and really kind of bringing a child rights perspective to Palestinian rights for American audiences was, was really key to pushing things forward. That tour took them from East Coast to West, but central to much of what's followed since was a meeting in Chicago. We're in Chicago. Uh, we were invited to participate in um, kind of a weekend event hosted by some local groups and, and Christian faith-based groups. It was uh, a woman named Joyce Castle who months before had you know, just an email showed up in my inbox while I was sitting at my desk in Ramallah and she had reached out asking for you know, a DVD copy of a, a short film um, that we had done uh, several years before that, you know, these children's testimonies and a bit of uh, background on the military court system and the experience of children. Uh, she wanted a couple copies to, to sort of share around and uh, have people view in Chicago. Brad and Rifat arrived in Chicago at the same time as Joyce had planned to screen the film, and so they spoke at the event. More importantly, they met many of the central figures who helped to lay the foundations for connecting with American audiences, and who are, today, an integral part of our grassroots organising in the US. Um, so Joyce Castle and then Jennifer Bing were really the, the two integral folks um, that, you know, from bringing us there finding and getting the space for us to speak uh, and then connecting us with others and, and really, you know, saying essentially that this is an issue that at least folks in Chicago really, really want to take on. Um, and, and it was really that weekend we spent in Chicago in 2013 that, you know, that was where No Way to Treat a Child was created. The response in Chicago was, was interesting compared to some other places that we visited um, and people that we talked to, because there is a real, I think, commitment and understanding of the experience of children in Palestine. Um, uh, you know, a number of the people that were sort of core to that original uh, group that we had met with had spent time in the West Bank, including in Jerusalem, as uh, ecumenical accompanists. So the people that would come as part of um, uh, program that that essentially puts uh, Americans, people from North America or Europe, uh, in specific Palestinian communities where uh, Israeli military presence or you know sort of escalating violence is is common, uh, and you know these people accompany children on their walks to school, uh, accompany children through checkpoints, and uh, sort of serve as a, a third party third set of eyes to sort of see what's happening on the ground and, and bring it and bring witness to it and bring it back to their community. So that was, I think, integral in the group in Chicago initially um, and, and having a deep understanding of what Palestinian children endure as part of military occupation. 
And the other component that I think was interesting around Chicago and, and the folks that we were meeting with is that the experience of Palestinian children was was almost identical in many ways to the the experience of um, you know black and brown Chicago youth and in, in, in their interactions with policing and law enforcement. The experiences of Chicago youth are as startlingly analogous to those of Palestinian youth as they are historic. Just this year, in March 2021, a Chicago police officer shot dead 13-year-old Mexican-American Adam Toledo, despite the fact that the child wasn't holding a weapon and had raised his hands. A Chicago police officer was also charged with the first-degree murder of black 17-year-old Laquan McDonald in October 2014. McDonald had been walking away from the officer when he shot him 16 times. Chicago police have also been captured on camera using excessive force against black protesters, including Miracle Boyd, a black youth leader who is filming at a black indigenous solidarity rally in 2020 when a police officer approached her and punched her in the mouth. Incidents like these are not uncommon in Chicago. It was a really interesting piece kind of that connected both the international experience of, of children and, and then kind of linked it to a community that was fighting against some of the same things, um, you know, different root causes, but ultimately the, the same issues. So that's really where I think it, it was interesting to see how grounded and understood the issues that we were bringing to these folks, um, you know, were understood. And, and I think that helped us just really move forward to the question of like, well, what can we do about it? Um, instead of kind of working to have folks understand the issues, they were just ready to go. At the time of the Chicago meet, Obama was in his second term as president, but discussions about the rights of Palestinians were still given little political focus or attention. Most of the context for Palestinian rights work in the U.S. was uh, around the boycott, divestment, sanctions call. And uh, there wasn't really a national campaign or a national focus, um, even around BDS, that I think was was galvanizing and coalescing folks. Um, so it's interesting to, to sort of think back to that moment because it, you know, even in, in conversations with people to to develop the No Way to Treat a Child campaign. And you know, we knew we wanted to have a specific focus on children, Palestinian children in Israeli military custody. But I think we still were, we had a lot of conversations around, well, what's the appropriate target? From the beginning, Brad's strategy was to ask difficult but absolute questions to lawmakers in a way that put them on notice. It was a strategy that risked alienating members of Congress and there was also a chance that they would refuse to engage altogether. But ultimately, it worked. The idea was that if we put narrow questions and, and narrow issues to policymakers, they could agree with us or not. But if it's narrow and clear, that's going to be the thing that helps us build something. Um, so the idea of I do you think children should be ill-treated and tortured and charged in military courts by Israeli forces? <laughs> yes or no, right? That was kind of the focus. And, and to that question, members of Congress, policymakers, whoever, they can agree with that or they don't have to. It, it's really more about asking that narrow question um, and building around that because it, it felt like some, the questions we were asking or things that were just so absolute that if you were going to deny them <laughs> or justify the treatment, like you would be an outlier, maybe not politically, right? But at least with, I think, a general audience, um, you'd be seen as an outlier. And that, that doesn't make any sense to justify the ill treatment, torture of children or, you know, the denial of due process. Like, these are all things that really run counter to just basic protections and, and norms that most people in the United States take for granted. At the time, we had felt that there was a lot of hesitation to really kind of 
do that and, and put hard questions to people. Um, and I think the Obama administration and, and generally there was a, a really, I don't know if it's a hands-off <laughs> approach or if it was, you know, less combative or contentious. Um, you know, people weren't so willing to really I think forced conversations, but at the same time, there weren't really the, the vehicles to do that. Um, so much of the discussion at the time and you know, even up to this moment focuses around the two-state solution. And you know, uh, it's time you had John Kerry, who was the special envoy, um, trying to restart peace talks and shuffling between the Israelis and Palestinian Authority. Um, and there was a real hesitation to, to sort of jump in and have a, a real focus on Palestinian rights. Uh, and I think that's what, what is the context that's existed for decades. Um, the peace process or the idea of a peace process has been an obstacle to just Palestinians having the basic rights that they deserve and are entitled to and that are necessary under international law. When we, we sort of first started to think about what a campaign would look like. Um, and I remember kind of distinctly, uh, I think I flew back to Chicago uh, at, at some point in the spring of, of 2014, possibly. And we had some conversations and, and I remember, you know, putting the idea out there that we should be focusing on members of Congress. We should be focusing on Congress. We should bring demands uh, specifically to Congress and ask them to do something about you know, the issues that we're focused on. And <laughs> I remember, you know, that was that was a wild idea at the time, or at least received as a wild idea. Uh, we have people kind of laughing at us, telling us that was futile. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it, it wasn't maybe the most <laughs> clear target to folks at the time. Um, and I think that was in part because there, there really just wasn't much political work going on around Palestinian rights. And the work that had been done previously had felt futile. Uh, and so, you know, we weren't saying, are we going to be able to, you know, change U.S. policy? Are we going to be able to, you know, have a concrete, tangible success in the form of legislation? No. And, you know, those weren't our goals. When we did that, <laughs> we launched the No Way to Free a Child campaign as a congressional advocacy campaign. You know, it was a, a, a bit of a bold move, I suppose. Um, but we, we knew we wanted something national in scope that a number of groups, organizations, individuals could coalesce around because we just didn't see the, the sort of national or nationwide political work happening. It's hard to understand the degree of persistence that Brad and other staff at DCIP and our partners on the campaign must have had in the face of such a political environment. It seemed so improbable from what you were saying, <laughs> or not improbable, but it uh, seemed quite a painful task to try and do this um, and to navigate all of that. I, gu I guess I'm asking more about like your attitude or the attitude of the campaign. <laughs> I think it, it, it's an interesting question because I think I approached it and, and I think the, the folks we were working with at the time, like we approached it knowing that it was futile, right? And, but not letting that stop us. It might be futile, but it doesn't mean these questions shouldn't be asked. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't expose what the, the, the policies are and the experience of Palestinian children. Um, and, I, and I think in some ways that's, that's been the thing that's carried through our work on the policy side is, you know, never again are we gonna sort of decide what questions we ask or what advocacy we do or what policy work we do based on what we think is possible. I mean, it sort of doesn't matter what's possible. <laughs> um, it's not about that. It's about demanding what's necessary and what Palestinians deserve. And then if we approach campaigns, issues, everything with that 
attitude or outlook, the burden shifts to policymakers to either agree with us or justify the serious breaches of international law that are the norm um, or the impunity that's provided by the United States or other governments. That burden shifting was crucial to mobilising support from the grassroots and from Congress. Far from being futile, the campaign took off. I I recognize that like immediately when we started having conversations and, and you know the campaign planning and we had dozens and dozens of people show up and want to be a part of it. <laughs> I think it was it was really early on that you know there was a lot of energy and there was a lot of sort of life brought to the organizing um, that I don't think we'd seen in that way previously. So, you know, in part, I think it wasn't that it was actually futile. I think it was more just this thought and that had been ingrained in, in a lot of people that have done some of the political work around Palestine or they just accepted that it was, it felt futile, right? Like, oh, we can't bring this to Congress. Like, they're never going to do anything. So I think it was futile only to the extent that, you know, people kind of put self-imposed limitations or <laughs> obstacles up to not do the, the work. But I think once we started putting it together, once we started just bringing these issues kind of intentionally to policymakers, um, you know, it was very clear that it, it wasn't futile. So in some ways it was <laughs> eliminating our own, um, you know, maybe more cynical view of, of, of policymakers in the U.S., and just saying, well, let's see, let's measure it. Let's bring them a narrow question and like see what we can do. Um, so I think the, you know, the real measurable moment was when we launched the campaign in June 2015 um, in Washington, D.C. We had three days of advocacy organized by um, American French Service Committee and, and, and DCI Palestine. Uh, we went into that kind of recruiting multiple different partners uh, and groups to, to support and sort of stand with us. We did a congressional briefing uh, where we had uh, Representative Keith Ellison, who is no longer in Congress, um, but he's the Attorney General in Minnesota. Um, he was, you know, one of the more outspoken members of Congress at the time, and, and he agreed to to speak and sort of host a congressional briefing that we used to kick off our No Way to Treat a Child campaign. Um, we went into those three days of advocacy just trying to get some awareness and some uh, recognition that the violations that Palestinian children face under Israeli military occupation, uh, particularly military detention system, right, were violations of international law and, and that, that they shouldn't happen. Um, we, we had a, a, a letter drafted that essentially said as much and was directed to the Secretary of State John Kerry at the time. And the letter, you know, was really just about saying these are violations of international law and you, John Kerry, should raise them directly with the Israeli government in your uh, dealings with them. We, we had that draft letter and really just hope that one member of Congress would kind of lead on it, agree to kind of make it their own and send it off to the State Department. And at the end of, you know, the, the advocacy day and sort of a couple of weeks, we had 19 members of Congress signed on to that letter uh, and it was sent off. That put things in motion. 19 members of Congress had stood up for Palestinian children and recognised the abuses they face in the Israeli military detention system. We brought that back to the grassroots organisations with whom we'd been engaging and with a clear proposal. It's going to take a nationwide effort to coalesce around this, but if we move it forward, we can put the rights of Palestinians on the agenda in a meaningful way. We went from, you know, this first year colleague letter, like our main task was just to kind of bring that back to people, disseminate it, show these members of Congress were now kind of our baseline for talking about Palestinian rights. Um, but in the end, right, this was just a letter. It, it really it was a, only a short-term vehicle um, and, and we needed much more uh, to continue sort of building 
a movement in the US demanding basic rights for Palestinians. So from there, we took a lot of time talking about the utility of this, how this can work, how we can move forward and, and really getting buy-in from a number of organizations and a number of grassroots leaders. Um, and then we followed up that 2015 letter with a letter the next year in 2016, um, right? It was a test, right? We've, we've had this one letter, got these members, we've talked to them, we've mobilized constituents to meet with, with members of Congress, talk to them about the issues. Let's check in and see where we are. Have we been able to grow our baseline? Um, so in 2016, we sent an, another letter to um, the Obama administration, this time asking for the creation of a special envoy for Palestinian children uh, that would be housed in the, the State Department. At that time, an increasing number of Palestinian children were being shot and killed by Israeli forces, and violence was escalating in Jerusalem in a way that we'd not seen. That violent period began in October 2015, when tensions broke out at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem. Frequent clashes erupted between Palestinians and occupying Israeli forces across the West Bank, including in East Jerusalem, with Israeli soldiers routinely employing excessive force. 32 Palestinian children were killed by Israeli forces and security guards in 2016, and in several of these cases, evidence that we gathered showed that the children did not pose a direct mortal threat at the time they were killed. It became apparent that Israeli forces appeared to be implementing a shoot-to-kill policy against children, despite the fact that international law required that intentional lethal force be used only when absolutely unavoidable. So we use that to, to really say like Palestinian children need protection. Uh, they need the special envoy to monitor what's happening specifically on the ground. That <clears throat> helped us you know, reach out to members of Congress again, mobilize constituents and, and make a bit of a push. Uh, but again, it was still this short-term vehicle. So 2016 was also an election year um, here in the US. So uh, we knew in November, the election would, you know, we, we, the Obama administration would be coming to an end after two terms. Um, and the two candidates were Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. When Donald Trump ultimately won the election, we went back to the drawing board and the campaign recalibrated. Ahead was an entirely new landscape within which we'd be advocating for the rights of Palestinians a landscape that appeared entirely devoid of space for precisely this undertaking. The campaign worked hard to develop ideas for the right approach and ultimately realised that ensuring the rights of children are protected and dismantling the occupation and oppression of Palestinians can be done regardless of a one state, two states or any other solution. For the purposes of introducing an effective advocacy vehicle, the political situation could be separated from the provision and recognition of rights for Palestinians. We sort of were in a holding pattern uh, until Inauguration Day and, and kind of getting the context and landscape. And I think even for, for members of Congress that we were working with closely, um, including Representative Betty McCollum, they sort of didn't know what to expect either. Um, uh, and then we were, I guess you could say, <laughs> apprehensive, unsure, like we knew we wanted this long-term vehicle and it, it just wasn't really clear if it was gonna happen. Um, like if this was the time, if we could actually sort of move it, if it would be swallowed up by all kinds of other issues uh, that were urgent and necessary to work on. So it was a little bit uncertain. Um, and, and, and moving into the, you know, the first 100 days and beyond of the Trump administration, you know, there was all kinds of turmoil, um, lots of stresses, lots of the folks that we were organizing were also organizing on a range of different issues that were kind of more at the top of the list now uh, with the way the Trump administration went about policymaking. In the first piece of legislation that we had introduced in November 2017, it was really just recognizing that Palestinians' children deserve rights and that uh, the U.S., by providing support to Israeli forces in the, the $3.8 billion every year, they have 
have an obligation to ensure that those funds aren't used to further violations of international law. Uh, so the, the first bill that we had introduced in 2017 by Representative Betty McCollum really just focused on the U.S. and making sure that none of the funds the U.S. provides to Israel is used to torture children, uh, hold them in administrative detention, deny due process, deny access to lawyers, etc. The day came for the introduction of the bill. Brad and the rest of the campaign knew that there were no guarantees and that the bill might not get its start without a hitch. But if they did pull it off and the bill was introduced, it would make history. I went to DC uh, for the introduction, we sort of planned the, the, the date, um, you know, how it was going to go down. Uh, Jennifer Bing, myself, and another colleague from DCI Palestine, who happened to be in the US at the moment, you know, we we're even on the day that it was supposed to be introduced, <laughs> we were kind of like waiting just to get the note saying, okay, it's been dropped into the hopper on the house floor we're off um and it and it it was tense because you know with all of this any little thing could could sort of change the calculation um given the the contentious nature of standing up and speaking out for palestinian rights in the u.s so uh, you know up until the moment we got the the note from representative mccollum's chief of staff that it was actually introduced you know, it always felt like there's a chance it might not happen. Um, but it was such a, a relief and so exciting to actually have sort of done this historic thing with all the people and all the effort that went into it. Um, and it and it felt, I think, just incredibly... It just felt incredible. But the work wasn't done with the introduction of the bill. It had to actually be co-sponsored for it to carry some weight. It was in some ways exciting, unsurprising, and like depressing at the same time, <laughs> if that's possible. Um, because we had this historic bill that was going to be introduced. We weren't exactly sure who were going to be the original sponsors, uh, along with Representative McCollum. And then, you know, I think the, the final list, it was good. <laughs> um, I, I forget the exact number, but it was around a dozen original co-sponsors. Um, and then it just gave us a really nice, I think, landing for a bill. Uh, you know, it wasn't a standalone individual member of Congress doing it. It was really a cohort of committed folks um, that had been, you know, involved in sort of signing the letters that we had the previous years. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like for such a narrow bill and uh, only focused on children in Israeli military detention, it felt like the opportunity was, was much grander. It should have, you know, 50 members, 100 members. This is not something that people should oppose. Um, but obviously the contentious nature of these issues in, in politics is, is a reality. So, you know, it was a mix of like, wow, we did it. Wow, look at that, those dozen members that support it. Uh, but also, you know, how come we don't have more? Um, but I think we we set out to do the hard work of, of trying to educate, move members, show them the, the way forward and how a bill and approach to policy that does focus on rights-based, um, you know, policy is actually empowering and, and can have an impact on broader discourse, broader policy, uh, and, and really make a difference in people's lives. In the time since, we've introduced three additional bills, keeping pace with the rolling congressional sessions. So in 2019, we introduced HR 2407, um, which, right, with, with every two years, there's a new Congress. So uh, House of Representatives uh, members are elected to two-year terms. Um, so once that congressional session ends, the, the bills that have been introduced all die if they haven't been passed and enacted into law. So in 2019, uh, with the, the 116th Congress, uh, we were left without a bill. Um, we wanted to follow up with another long-term vehicle, uh, and this time it was H.R. 2407. It took a little bit of a different 
approach, we tried to kind of escalate the accountability um, focus of the bill, uh, but essentially it was the same prohibitions uh, around ensuring that U.S. funds don't support ill treatment of Palestinian children in the military detention system. Um, you know, the time that we introduced that, we had built kind of a, a broader coalition uh, than before using the, the bill in the previous Congress um, and, and kind of had additional congressional briefings on Capitol Hill, uh, really using the bills to drive a lot of energy and focus onto the issues to, to hopefully get more members of Congress in support. Um, it also happened kind of later on where uh, Israeli elections and sort of commitments to annex territory in the West Bank made by the Israeli government, it created a real kind of focus around you know, the issue of annexation, the issue of home demolitions, forced displacement uh, by the Israeli government. And we had approached Representative McCollum, you know, with a, a basic um, kind of approach to essentially say that you know the U.S. does not recognize annexation, does not recognize the, the seizure of Palestinian land by the Israeli government, um, and we sort of saw this as a shorter-term vehicle to just jump in, get some rights-based support for uh, you know one of the main issues dominating the the news and, and discourse at the time, um, and then use that to really kind of bring in. Uh, other members of Congress to, to kind of focus on the increasing kind of number of issues that um, they're willing to, to speak out on, you know, in policy. In 2021, another congressional session rolled in and we got to work quickly, introducing HR 2590. The bill has a similar prohibition <laughs> related to military detention and ensuring that U.S. funds don't go towards those prohibited purposes. But this bill is a bit unique because it also expands out to include uh, prohib prohibition against U.S. funds provided to Israel from uh, supporting annexation or forced evictions, destruction of property, home demolition, of Palestinian uh, property in occupied territory. So. Uh, HR 2590, the current bill, is, is, goes beyond what we've had in the, the previous bills um, and sort of takes a broader approach to trying to have a rights-based policy around end-use restrictions uh, connected to the funding that's provided to the government of Israel from the United States. Having successfully navigated the Trump administration, the campaign has recently had to readjust again this time to the administration of President Biden, who was elected in November 2020. We've had a strong response and more successes kind of early on already this year, under the first year of the Biden administration. We've had uh, members of Congress introduce legislation to block an arms sale of $735 million to the government of Israel. And um, we've had members of Congress speaking out against the bombardment of Gaza in May 2021. A lot has changed. The discourse has shifted. The willingness of members of Congress to sort of speak out uh, on a range of issues is, is increasing. The success of the campaign so far and, and utilizing the different legislative vehicles to build grassroots pressure and a broader movement demanding Palestinian rights is I think historic in many ways. The reality is though, is, is, is bold and as great the, the growth has been, you know, we still have massive challenges and obstacles. We just have to keep pushing, keep organizing. And, and I think as it becomes more clear through polling and, and just public response to policies that ending U.S unconditional support to Israel is what a growing number of people in the U.S. want. I think that the policy vehicles, the actual impact on policy and the political power that the um, Palestinian rights movement can, can garner will be much greater.
to find out how you can get involved, visit our website, dci-palestine.org. Thanks for listening.